So then I'd, I'd quite like to, to, to focus in on this thing you said about the reason that neoliberalism sort of appealed to both, because like this is this is something that's, that, that's really interesting. Um, and it's something that I find difficult to like get people to grasp sometimes when I'm talking about about politics, because to me, at least now, this is just my um, half baked and uh, <laughs> naive 20 somethings opinion, but. It seems to me that we have a, a situation where both major parties on both sides of the Atlantic are have been broadly in favor of basically the same policies. I mean, I feel like perhaps in America there's a little more difference, especially more recently. Um, but broadly, they seem to be after the same thing. And that this this idea that it's the freedom and like the free market side that's kind of associated with like traditionalism and, and like maybe more Christian conservative values is appealing to that side of the political spectrum whilst cosmopolitanism and, and globalism is is appealing to to another side. Like I hadn't actually ever heard anyone explain it in that way as to why it because because that that helps explain it a lot more than all the parties are corrupt and they just like money. Because I don't think that's not true, but I mean that your your explanation helps to flesh out how that became the popular ideology amongst the people as well, which is yeah really interesting. Well, my, my, I should say my my view on for your listeners, some of this some of them will know this, but my my view on this is different from a lot of writing on neoliberalism. Many who write on neoliberalism see it as a, a elite project uh, to try and constrain and undermine. Uh, the democratic, uh, to uh, try and constrain and undermine democracy and, and constrain the participation of ordinary people in, uh, in their politics. And it's about unleashing the power of capital and, and further enriching the rich, impoverishing the poor, holding them down. I don't deny the mechanisms uh, in neoliberalism that are pushing a lot of wealth to the top and a lot of people to the bottom. That certainly is, ha is happening. One only has to compare the gap between CEOs and ordinary workers in 1960 in America with the ratio in 2000. Hmm. In 1960, on average, a CEO made 20 times what an ordinary worker made. That's two zero. In 2000, that same CEO made 300 times what an ordinary worker made. So part of what's characteristic of neoliberalism is a vast expanse of economic inequality. So I don't, I don't deny that, but I, I don't think that neoliberalism, ha its appeal can be explained just simply as a top-down movement and elites pulling the wool over the masses' eyes. I think in America in particular, the promise of neoliberalism uh, connected to older uh, traditions of freedom and individuality. It carried within it a promise of personal emancipation, reinvention, um, becoming someone different that you wanted to be from circumstances you were born into. For most people, this freedom turned out to be false, but the promise of freedom was really very, very powerful uh, and, uh, and, and very seductive. Uh, and it's 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 not just people on the right who pursue this uh, message of freedom. I, I look at the new left, um, which arises in the 1960s, and is bitterly critical of capitalism and inequality, economic, social, racial. Uh, but it's also very critical of the New Deal, because it sees in the New Deal not equality and democracy, but a vast system of government uh, cooperation with private corporations to have these mass institutions over which ordinary people had very little control. Uh, and the goal of the new left uh, became to free individual consciousness and people from uh, these vast government private corporate arrangements. And so we, even within the new left, there was a movement toward individual and personal freedom that led some in that movement to find neoliberalism appealing, not, not directly because they weren't budding capitalists, but some of them became budding capitalists. If you go back to the origins of 
Silicon Valley and the IT revolution in the United States. Um, the, uh, the, West, the prominence of the West Coast, uh, people like Steve Jobs, you know, he spent a, quite a number of years being a hippie while he was inventing his computer and his, his, the kind of computer he was inventing, the personal computer was deeply associated with the dream of freedom. Stuart Brand, uh, who uh, was doing a lot of drugs in the 60s and hanging out with Timothy O'Leary and other psychedelics and uh, and the, he's the author of the Whole Earth Catalog about um, removing one from ordinary pursuits of life and living autonomously and living genuinely and living authentically. I would say clearly uh, a left message. Uh, he's also going to be one of the creative spirits behind cyberspace and the IT revolution. And at some point, these creative spirits who are very much involved in the IT um, revolution are going to hook up with venture capital from Wall Street and, and build what comes to be the monster of our time, which is Silicon Valley. Uh, so there are roots of neoliberalism on, on, on the left. And, and, um, and over time, uh, because of other circumstances that become relevant, they, they merge with elements of the new, new right that are also very invested in liberating the individual or liberating the firm from constraints. And they do uh, find a kind of common ground which allows uh, neoliberalism to appeal to, to appeal to those on the left and to those on the right. As to your point about all the, the parties are the same, I think at certain moments they become quite similar to each other. But I would also say we have to be um, uh, specific about the, the moment in which this is occurring. And mm -hmm. I think it's not true of the Democratic Party in the 1980s, but it, it does become true of the Democratic Party of the 1990s under Bill Clinton, a very similar path to the Labor Party under, under Tony Blair. But at a later time, you also have rebellions within these parties, Jeremy Corbyn in, 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 in Britain and Bernie Sanders in the United States, and a revival of the left. So there, there are, at different moments, um, concord and then um, attempts at rupture. And we can talk about why those attempts at rupture have been successful or fail or 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 not, uh, but it's not simply one steady story of of two parties always being in cahoots with each other. Although there are certainly moments uh, of when neoliberal values are hegemonic in both parties, and that is my definition of a political order: the ability of one political party, in this case the Republican Party under Ronald Reagan, to compel its antagonist, the Democratic Party to play on its playing field. And Margaret Thatcher is reputed to have said, this could be apocryphal because uh, there's no recording of Margaret Thatcher having actually said this. It, this was said to someone who asked her a question around to, um, 2000, uh, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment? And Tony she's Blair, reported right? to have yeah. said, Tony Blair. Right, and that's, but that's, that's a wonderful that's, that's a wonderful illustration, really, of of of, uh, of how hegemony works, where your opponents feel compelled to play on your turf. Because mm. famously, Blair, the first person that Blair, I think, like went to see after winning election, or one of the first people he went to see was apparently, at least, Margaret Thatcher, um, which is yeah, interesting. But yeah, that's. It is also interesting to me, and maybe this is that the 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 new labor essentially, whilst pretending to not be like literally be the like the anti Tories when when they were trying to get elected, assumed a lot of their yeah the 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 neoliberal policies of of the yeah the Thatcher era, and then managed to keep out the original people who conceived of that of that ideology essentially for like what was it 12 years 12 years mm -hmm. 12 years yeah 12 years uh, or even 13 years and uh, why do you think that the because the same thing actually technically i guess maybe happened a little bit with with clinton although it's more difficult to say in america just because of the way the terms work but why do you think it is that, that the parties that initially brought that ideology to bear in like a br in broader politics then proceeded to lose power to the other party like doing the same like 
endorsing like a similar ideology. That's I hadn't actually even considered that. Why do you think that is? It's a really interesting story, and it also helps to explain why Republicans in the 1990s hated Clinton with every bone in their body because they felt exactly <laughs> what, what you've just been expressing. These are our ideas. This is a moment when we should be dominant in all respects, not just our ideas, but we should have the presidency. We should have both houses of Congress, uh, majorities in both of them. They had that for two years, but um, not, not, be, not, not beyond this. And here comes this man without principles who a shapeshifter and um, he, he steals our thunder. Uh, I think, you know, one, ex one explanation is uh, that both Blair and Clinton were brilliant politicians. Uh, and whatever you think about them in terms of the quality of their politics, and I know, uh, uh, you know, Blair is um, very controversial and in many quarters dis intensely disliked figure in Britain now because of the war in, war in Iraq. You but, could say that, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you could say that. Uh, but that, you know, that doesn't, that should not detract from our understanding of the brilliance of him as a political figure when he, uh, especially in the early years of his, uh, uh, his prime, minister's, prime ministership. So I think it's partly the brilliance of these, these, these two politicians and, uh, uh, and part of the brilliance of a, polit of a politician is to be able to uh, read the pulse of the electorate uh, and, and, and craft an appeal that is gonna be very popular with them. And I think they, they were both quite brilliant in, in that respect. And I think there's a way in which uh, they understood that they could rub some of the harshness off of the neoliberal policies. Uh, and I think both of them did that without undermining liberal, neoliberalism per se, right? Mm. Uh, and, and there may have been a recognition on the part of parts of the electorate. Those parts of the electorate might have said, uh, well, we don't really like neoliberalism, but maybe the Clinton or Blair version will, will be okay. Mm. And it'll certainly be better than the Tory or the Republican version, which is true. Um, and um, so may, we'll go along with it. Yeah. Uh, now, there's one other element to this that Matt, uh, there's two other elements that matter to this in terms of the timing. One is the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and of communism between 1989 and 1991. So you don't, you, you've already confessed to being born in the 1990s, right? So yes. <laughs> you, you, won't have, you, you won't have any firsthand memory of this, but it's the, um, the shock of that was extraordinary because no one thought that the Soviet Union and communism would go quietly. It, it was thought it would behave like most declining empires. You just fight forever to maintain whatever you have. And suddenly Gorbachev of the Soviet Union is dismantling the Soviet Union and communism is, is ending with it. So this is a, a tremendous shock. And it, um, the political theorist, Fran, uh, Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama once wrote, with the passing of communism, the last universal alternative to liberal capitalism passed from the world. Mm. And, uh, and Blair are the, in a, in a way, Blair and uh, Clinton are the first post-communist um, leaders of their countries. And so, uh, uh, and I think the collapse of communism not only obviously buried communism but it created a broader crisis for left politics mm. because the most spectacular experiment in left politics, that being the Soviet Union, yeah. crashed so, so spectacularly. How do you go on being a socialist mm. in that aftermath? How, how, do you, how do you do that? What do your politics look like exactly? This is an understudied and in, in under, 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 under poorly understood part of the 90s thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video don't forget to like share subscribe and leave a comment for us in the comments below let me know what you thought and if you'd like to see more of this from the show thank you and we'll see you again next time